declaration tonight. Father, you are faithful. Faithful, faithful, oh, Jesus. Father, you are faithful. And we have put our trust in you. Our God who reigns, our God who reigns. Right now we praise your name. our hands and sing the highest praise to him. That we tapped into something upstairs. I think what our church congregation came to the service with last Wednesday was hunger for the presence of Jesus. And it doesn't matter what songs we sing, it doesn't matter who's up here on the, on the platform, it doesn't matter who's preaching, if people come, if we as a church family come with a hunger for the presence of Jesus, the Bible says, the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. So I wonder if we could take a moment and just praise him right now. We worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Sing bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. Can we sing it out together? song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing let me be singing when the evening comes oh so 
bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name, singing like never before, oh my soul, worship you. and reasons for my heart to find Say bless the Lord Oh my soul Oh my soul I worship your name Oh sing like name Jimmy And then forevermore, oh, forevermore, yeah, bless the Lord, oh, my soul, oh, my soul, I worship His holy name, sing like Sing it together. Worship Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. Yes, I worship your holy name. Jesus, I worship your name. Hallelujah. Oh, let's lift up our voices to the Lord right now. We worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, Lord, we're looking forward to that day. That great day, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And with this spirit of faith, I want us to lift up a couple of needs before the throne. I want us to lift up the Calvary Church. They lost their senior pastor. And uh, funerals start tomorrow and Friday. One for the church and the community and another for the pastors of our fellowship. And they need a prayer cover. We also want to remember Charles Cox. He needs a miracle in his body. 80% of his stomach is covered in cancer. This is God territory. Amen. Don't ever become weary praying for impossible situations. This is how God is going to demonstrate his power to the world. Come on, let's bring these needs to the gate. Can we bring the need to the gate? In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we pray for the Calvary Church. We pray for Pastor Tom Ellis. We pray, Lord, for that family 
the Pasley family in Jesus' name. We speak strength and comfort to them, Lord. We pray for a special kind of grace, Lord, as they celebrate the life of a great man. Help them, Lord. Put a hedge around them and bless them in Jesus' name. We pray for Charles Cox in your precious name. Lord, you are the great physician. You have the final say in this situation, and we know in whom we have believed. We know that you are able, Lord. We know that you have all power in your hand. In Jesus' name, by the authority of the Word of God, the power that's in the name of Jesus, and the blood of Jesus Christ, Lord, we take dominion over the cancer in its body in Jesus' name. Be glorified in this situation, we pray, Father. Thank you, Lord. Let's clap our hands and thank the Lord that he hears us when we pray. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. We're so very happy to have Brother Terry Schock with us. A great man of God, a great leader. Every time I encounter this man, I grow. And I want you to know over these last few days, just interacting with him, I have grown. He has blessed our leaders. He's blessed our pastor staff. And now he's going to speak to our entire church family on a very important subject. And I want you to help me welcome our friend, Brother Terry Schock. Well, why don't we just continue to give God praise? Can we do that? Thank you, Jesus. 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 It's always good to be with this church family, and thank you for coming in on Wednesday night and acting like it's Sunday morning. Boy, you don't, everybody doesn't come into church on Wednesday night with the focus you guys do, so you guys, I, I, guess, that's, I guess that's okay. I love the Sotos, love this church, love being connected to all of the, um, for the uh, staff people, your leaders here. This church is in wonderful hands. Wonderful hands. It's just kind of like just, I mean, it is. It is. Just, just find a place and jump in and start flowing with it. Because it's going the right direction and some wonderful things are happening. Joshua, the 24th chapter, verses 14 and 15. I enjoy ministering, I love teaching, I love preaching, I love church, I love church leadership, I love it all, but I really like what I'm going to share tonight, I, I mean I, I like this one, I really like it, Joshua 24, 14 and 15, now therefore hear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth, it's not enough just to be sincere, some people are sincerely wrong. So it's sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. And then Joshua made this statement, and this, if you were going to sum up Joshua's life, I think this would be the statement that would sum up his life. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I want to speak to you tonight on this subject, me and my house. Me and my house. Can you close your eyes and just ask God to speak to you individually, personally, uh, that, that we would have that we would have revelation. Lord, Lord, we, we need you. We thank you for the spirit that we feel. We thank you for the spirit that's in this, this house that can give revelation. And God, we're believing for revelation and application tonight. We're, Lord, we're believing that when we walk back in our homes, if we're the only one, if, if we live by ourselves, if there are other people there, that our homes are going to be different. They're going to move in the right direction. Let it be done in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. The issue is clearly me and my house, not you and your house. 
some people, they never really uh, get it right because they're so concerned about somebody else and their house that they don't focus enough on me and my house. Now, if you're the only apostolic Christian in your house, then, then tonight it's, it's me and me. Uh, you, you, cannot, you cannot help it if you are in a position where you're praying for an unsaved spouse or, or you're in that type of a situation, then do not let this frustrate you. You can only make decisions for you. <clears throat> but those of you that, that are here and, you know, both of you or, or maybe you're the only one in your house and, and you're a single parent, but you're, you know, seeking after God... Let's, let's talk about me and my house. I grew up in a home with, uh, with three brothers. There were four boys in our family, and I have often said that my mother will have a special place in heaven for raising four boys. Uh, from the youngest to the oldest, there's an eight-year span. I'm number three. I have a brother that's a year and ten days older than me. That makes me an accident. <laughs> you know, my, uh, my parents would say, you know, you know, after I got a little older and I, you know, kind of figured out, you know, how much time between babies and, and then realized where I came, I, I looked at my parents, I said, I was an accident, wasn't I? <laughs> oh, no, no, you, no, you were, you were a gift from God. I said, yeah, I may have been a gift from God, but I was an accident because you guys are not that stupid. So we had, we had four boys in, uh, in our family, and, uh, and my dad, my parents failed math. They didn't know how to count to three. It, you know, if we were doing something wrong, I started hearing, as I got older, I started hearing parents counting. I was like, what? Counting? Like you get a three-second chance to do what they tell you to do? I mean, I was raised in another dispensation. I was raised under the law. I mean, I, mean, I was raised under the law. I had godly parents, but I am telling you. Yeah, so one of those days, uh, me and Dwayne, my brother that is a year older than me, and my oldest brother, Jack, we were all three getting a whipping. And... And so, Jackie, you know, Dad had us cross the bed, rear one, rear two, rear three, and and so he was he was you know just working uh, right down the line. And my oldest brother had a friend that was over at our house, and he lived Caddy Corner, and his name was Mackie, Mackie McGrew. And so Dad Dad whipped Jack, whipped Dwayne, whipped me, and reached for Mackie. And Mackie said. I'm not your son. And he said, well, then get out of here, or I'm, I'm going to whip you too. So every, every now and then, um, we would think that we could tell, help our parents out by telling them how our friends, how their house, how they did things in their house. And my parents would quickly let us know, you're not living in their house. You know, this is me and my house. Time out. Time out. Man, we dealt with put out. I mean, I mean, it wasn't time, time out. I'm going to put you in time out. Listen, if that works for your kids, that's how you do it. I'm not here to try to mess you up. But, I, you know, I am just here to say that uh, your kids are very blessed if you know how to count to three. <laughs> this is what I know about our homes. I know that unless there's major change in the homes, the church is stuck. The, the homes are the issue. 
When, when the homes are out of step with the purpose of God, then the church is so negatively affected that the church is relegated to a weekend drug to just try to help us feel better. You know, come shoot up on a little Holy Ghost or shoot up on a little worship, smoke a little worship, something. It becomes a weekend drug. Can you imagine what could happen if we could get it right in our homes? Can you, can you imagine what could happen if we could do that? Well, let me tell you, it can happen. It, it can. Homes are not going to be perfect, I promise you. We don't just float on clouds at our house and talk in tongues. I mean, it's, it's reality, okay? Life is life. Life is a challenge. It's a challenge for every one of us. But we can have godly homes. The only way that we're going to have godly homes is if we focus on key values. Because it's values that determine culture. I can tell that this church has a value of praying. I can, tell you, I can tell that this church values worship because there is a culture of it. So our, if you want a culture, you have to choose the values that will produce that culture. In, uh, in our home growing up, I was thinking about some of the values that, that we had. Here, here was something that I never heard in all of my life. I never heard this. Are we going to church tonight? You know, um, uh, do you, you know, my dad's name was Jack. My mother's name is Patty. Patty, do you feel like going to church? You know, are, are we going to church tonight? No, no, that, that was not the way it was. Coming to church was valued. I mean, it was a value. This is how serious of a value it was. Dad, I'm sick. How sick? <laughs> you're talking, and I, and I notice that you're breathing. How sick are you, you know? Well, but I'm running temperature. What is it? You know, because if you're running just a little bit of temperature, you can sit in the balcony. <laughs> you understand? Are you getting it? I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about values. I, I really am. Uh, my dad was very sick, and he passed away when he was 42 years old. And, uh, and he, he went into the hospital one Sunday night when the Super Bowl was on. And so I felt like during church that I needed to go out and call and check on him. Well, we had all said, you know, you know what, Dad, we'll, can we stay with you tonight? You know, boys, no, you're not, you're not staying with me. I know what you want. You want to watch the Super Bowl, and, and that's not going to happen. Church is going on, and so that's not going to happen. You're going to go to church. And my dad was a man of integrity. He didn't lay up in the hospital and watch it either, since we couldn't be. But so I go call him during church. Dad, are you feeling okay? He said, Terry, I'm feeling fine. I'm not going to tell you what the score is because I don't know. Now get back in church. <laughs> values. There, there, was, there was just values that, that we had. Um, the fact that I'm standing up here speaking to you tells you that we valued not talking back because I'm still alive. <laughs> there, there was another... There was another value that we had, and it was this. You don't whine. You don't whine. You, that was a value around our house. You just don't whine. Whenever um, I carried that on with my two children, and, and I, I, just, I just got it in their head. Shocks don't whine. See, whining made me want to do things that I could get arrested for. So I had to create a value against it. Whining. Man, I can't take whiners. So if there's something you can't take, just make a value about it, and then you'll... We had, we had different values growing up. We, we cleaned up our mess. Uh, allowance at our house was very interesting. My rear end was allowed to feel good if I mowed the yard. <laughs> it was. It was. It was an amazing allowance. 
my rear end was allowed to feel good if I washed the dishes. I learned how to wash the dishes when I had to stand on a chair to wash the dishes. <laughs> oh, boy. I just want to consider tonight and the rest of my time, and I know what time you usually get out of here, 8.15. So any of you that are wondering, did they tell the visiting guy? Yes. <laughs> Yes, 8.15, the visiting guy asked, because I, cause I just, I don't want to be the guy that people hear is coming back and they're like, oh no, uh, you know, free night, I don't want to hear him, so, you know, I used to tell people I might do bad, but I won't do bad long. Four values, four values that I believe would turn our homes right side up. I believe it would release the ch our church into another dimension. I'm totally convinced. Number one, we have to have spiritual homes. We have to have spiritual homes. You say, well, you know, I figured you were going to say pray Bible or something. Well, let's talk about it. Romans 8, 5 through 8. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. If you're carnal, it leads to death. If you want life and peace, you have to have a spiritual mind. Verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So we have to have a spiritual mind in order to keep our spirit under control. You say, um, well, I just lose it. I, you know, I just, I've just got a short fuse. Well, there's a spiritual problem. Short fuses and spiritual issues go together. That, that's what I got whippings for growing up, my temper. That, that, was, that was what they was beating on me about. Proverbs 25, 28. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. An out-of-control spirit has no protection against the enemy. You know, take a walk. If you're about to explode, take a walk. Walk a mile. Walk ten. Walk whatever it takes. Because when you lose your cool, you lose more than your cool. You lose influence. Now, our spirits have to do with our level of spirituality, and we must have spiritual homes. My, my wife, uh, her second cousin in the uh, Alexandria area, they went on vacation and they were gone for a week, and they came back from vacation and opened the door of their house, and they had the surprise of their life. Something had malfunctioned in the city, and for one week, sewage had backed up in their house. For one week. Their home was a total loss. A to they lost everything. I mean, it might as well have burned down. They... They absolutely lost everything. And whenever I, was, uh, whenever I heard about that, I was thinking, oh, how? Ugh, ugh. I mean, how in the world? And then it hit me. I wonder what it would be like if we walked in our homes and asked for God to show us in the Spirit how much sewage is in our homes. How much sewage is pouring in through... These and screens and music and all of these things. We've got to take the trash out. We got to stop the sewage. You cannot repent enough every Sunday to be able to be powerful if you're living in sewage. Well, I would I would have you know people ask me whenever I was pastoring. Uh, you know, uh, it, you know, is it is is this okay? Is is that okay? Is is it okay to watch this? Is it okay to watch that? And and I've you know, I just finally got to the place where I thought, if it's not okay to do it, it's not okay to watch it. 
we, we, we are complicating this. There's no way you'd let people walk in in front of your family in the flesh and, and do some things that you'll watch on a screen. If it's not okay to do it, it's, it's not okay to watch it. The Word of God clearly says, set no wicked thing before your eyes. It says, do not take pleasure in unrighteousness. And what we feed on is of utmost importance because we cannot feast at the devil's table all week and then come to church on Sunday for a snack pack happy meal with God and live abundantly and powerful. There's no way. You can't do it. That Sunday snack pack with God is not going to, to be more powerful in your life than the devil's table. Where we've been gorging Monday through Saturday. For some people, Halloween is every Sunday and they dress up like a religious person. And, and, they, and they come. And what we need is we need a spiritual home. And now, let's let, I'm going to spend more time on this one than the other one, so don't get nervous. But let's quit complicating this. Let's quit complicating a spiritual home. Now, now you're definitely going to have to take the trash out. You've got to take the trash out. My, my dad, oh, oh my goodness, this one just popped in my head. My dad told us, boys, get rid of the rock music. Get it out of the house. We were like, sure, Dad. Sure. Well, we didn't. And uh, we came home about two weeks later, and we thought Dad was burning leaves in the backyard. Dad wasn't burning leaves. Dad went through our room, and if he burned some Imperials records because they had long hair. He, he burned some of our religious Christian music because he just looked on the cover and thought they were bad. <laughs> Clean out the house. Then I, then we start, I started listening to it again at one point and then Brother Lumpkin got up and he preached this convicting message about you young people, you've got to get the junk out of your life and all that business. And we always went to Pizza Inn on Rogers after Sunday night service and my brother Dwayne, it was a year and 10 days older than me, uh, I said, hey, are we going to Pizza Inn on Rogers? He goes, not yet, man. He said, we better go home and, and this was a few years later, we better go home and, and get this, these other things and put them in dad's recliner so he doesn't come through our rooms and burn up God knows what. So we, before we went to Peace Inn on Rogers, we went around, we gathered up, you know, that we didn't have near as much as we had at one point because he had already burned all that. And, and, you know, we had just a few little things that, that we needed to put in his recliner so he could get. Now, now, why are we overcomplicating just joining hands and praying over a need? Why, why, is, that, why is that so hard? Sir, it doesn't matter if your wife can outpray you. Prayer is not an Olympic sport where the angels are going, whoa, ugh, that was a two. <laughs> Man, come on. You can't be better than that. Hey, got a little volume on that one. Let's give him a five. Got a little shake out of that one, a little chill bump. We're we up to an eight and a half now. That, it's not an Olympic sport. It's talking to God. It's, it's just joining hands and saying, God, we have a need. Please help us. We, uh, we always uh, keep a bottle of oil uh, on the wall, like there's a little shelf on the wall, and it's this bottle of oil. And, and if somebody gets sick in our house, they get anointed. You know, don't talk about it. I'm sick. Well, let's do something about it. The Bible says you can anoint. Our, our little, uh, our, our son, whenever he's 10 years old, Melanie was sick one time, and, and he, he went in, and uh, he just took the oil himself and went and anointed her while she was in bed, and God healed her. God brought her up out of the bed. Can we quit, can we quit complicating this business? Can we quit making this stuff so spooky 
that, that we won't do. I mean, if your family's under attack, choose a day and call it a fast day and fast. And if your kids are little, then maybe, you know, they just don't need to eat a cookie that day or something. But let's get these principles. We're going to have a spiritual home, and a spiritual home does not mean we're all freakos. We're just going to have a spiritual home. A couple of weeks ago, uh, we, were, we were praying for this specific situation, and it's, and it was, it's a serious situation, and, and, and this was just about two, three weeks ago, and so I was in my place praying, and uh, Melanie was doing her devotion in the den in her chair, and she remembered a way that God had spoken to me before. And she was sitting in there, and she prayed, God, would you speak to Terry about this situation like you did that last one? And it happened immediately. We, we weren't even talking about it. It's just... It's just, you know, me praying in the morning and her praying in the morning is just normal. It's normal. I'm convinced I can't make it without God. And I want God to be convinced every day that I know I can't make it without Him. So I tell Him every day, I can't make it with, without you. Let's have spiritual homes Unless when we have questions, why don't we go to the Word of God for some answers? The concordance is your friend. You know, God connection is extremely, extremely important. And, and we, we must, we must make sure that, that we are connected to God and we must make sure that everyone in our home is born again as is spoken in the Word of God. I believe I said this here Sunday, I'll say it quickly, that when you want to take full, full, the message of full salvation in the Word of God, it's going to include grace and faith and confession and repentance and baptism in the name of Jesus Christ and the infilling of the Holy Ghost and endurance because everything I just said is connected to salvation. It's not a Pentecostal thing. It's a Bible thing. We need to be, we cannot be spiritual without being born of water and spirit. And so it must be. So spiritual, number one. That's a value. We need to focus on that. The second value that I believe would, would just change our homes in a major way, and that is speak life. Speak life. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. We are literally created in the image of God, therefore we have creative power in our words. We do. We, we with our words, we create life or we kill. Some of you can remember, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's crazy. Words will kill you. Proverbs 15, 1 and 2. A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. In other words, a soft answer, not a hard answer, because painful words stir up anger, and anger is deadly. A soft answer turns away wrath. Well, somebody just cut at you and they're just losing it. Well, I'll tell you if you elevate and you just start and then they... I mean, somebody's got to say, whoa. Somebody, somebody's got to bring it down. I mean, people get killed because it just keeps elevating. Verse 2. The tongue... And before somebody would get killed physically, there's much, much that has been killed before it ever gets there. I'm going to be talking at a, at a church this Easter about, you know, uh, death and, and he overcame death and all that. How about all the death we deal with without caskets, flowers, and meals? How about death that we deal with in our life that it's just kind of, 
we're just by ourselves and things within us are just dying. He has the power over that also. We have the power to kill with our words. Verse 2, the tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright. Now in the home, we have knowledge of each other. I promise you, I could tick Melanie off quicker than anybody. She could tick me off quicker than anybody. I could tick my kids off quicker than anybody. They could tick, you know why? We have knowledge of each other. We know where the hot buttons are. We have knowledge, but the tongue of the wise will use knowledge aright. A wise person uses knowledge in a good manner, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. And spouses, we need to remind ourselves that our spouse was God's child before they were our spouse. And God is a father that we really don't want to make mad. When, when I look at my wife and my children as they're God's children before she's my wife, before they're my children, then it changes everything. If we can learn to speak life, it will change lives. You say, well, we just we can't correct. Is that taking correction out? Oh, I, no, absolutely not. It's not taking correction out. It's putting it in a, it's connecting it in a spirit that will bring life. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Faithful are the wounds. I have had some friends that have wounded me, but they've wounded me in a way that was, that was moving me forward and not tearing me down. There have been times that Melanie and I have had conversations. You need to get to the place in your marriage that you, that you can discuss things that need to be changed in each other's life. And it be for the good. Now, you have to really work on that relationship before that's going to happen. You know, thank, thank God. I mean, if Melanie looks at me and says, uh, Terry, I really, we really need to talk about something, you know, I'm not looking at her like, no, nope, just save it. I don't want to talk about it. I want to hear it. Because we both mutually want to be better. And I know she's not going to say something to me that's going to try to tear me down. She's going to say something that is going to say, look, you might not be seeing this, but... You know, it was, we, we left a conversation the other night. I was, I was dealing with something with some leaders, and we left. I mean, this hadn't even been a month ago. And, and she, said, she said, that was some great advice you gave them. I said, thank you. She said, but you're not, you're not stopping long enough to let them talk. You know, you're, you're overpowering people. Well, I mean, I was glad to hear that. I want people to listen to me. I don't want them to go the other direction. You, we, have, we have to use knowledge aright, and, and we need to be speaking life. Speaking life. You elders in this church, speak life into these young people. Please, use your wisdom and use your years of experience to speak life. Tell, tell some young couple sometime, listen, it's tough, but just hang in there. Don't do anything stupid. Just hang in there. I mean, we need to speak life. This needs to be a campus of life. Life. There's a lot I can say there, but I don't have time. You can just fill in whatever you think. <laughs> Number three. Number three, discovering and activating God gifting. Discovering and activating God gifting. It was a good day in our house whenever I quit expecting Melanie to be somebody else. And I locked in on her gifting. And I locked in on 
Kendra, my daughter's gifting. And I locked in on Brayden, my son's gifting. We've got to get out of trying to rewire. God has wired everybody. God has put value in everybody, and it's not about us rewiring people. It's about us finding out the wiring that God has wired them, and then let's put them in a place where that can grow. And it definitely, Matthew 25, 14 through 15 talks ab about that. Uh, but I can tell you it's extremely important that we work with, with wiring. I've said this here before, let me repeat it again. It doesn't matter how long that runway is, that pig ain't going to fly. <laughs> that pig can run and run and run till it oinks out. It's not going to fly. It's not wired to fly. God did not wire one pig to fly. Now, don't go home and look at somebody and say, okay, pig, I'm not going to have you, I'm not going to expect you to, to fly anymore. Let's, let's, not, let's not get into that because we just dealt with that a while ago about speak life, not, not death. But we must get into understanding why. Do you realize that Jesse, King David's father, was raising a king right under his nose and did not know it? Did, listen, he didn't even think enough of his own son to even put him in the lineup. He, I mean, here, here David was out there taking care of sheep. And do it. And, but when the prophet came, he, let's not miss what is inside our homes. Let's lock in on wiring and release people, our family members, let's release them into what God has put in them to help them grow. Our, our homes must be turned into equipping centers. Equipping centers. You know, the Bible says train up a child in the way it should go, not entertain down. It's train up, not entertain down. Just, just you know, uh, putting a kid in front of something else to watch or... Or, you know, just to get them out of our hair. Now, I know you've got to have a break. I totally understand that. But I'm, I thank God I was raised by parents who were about training. I mean, I, I looked, I look around, I've looked around at, at other people my age when I was a teenager thinking, don't they know any better than that? Well, they didn't. Because they were not being raised by equippers and trainers. I was blessed. I, you know, I, my dad was sick all of his life. His mother died at 42 of the same disease. That He had a kidney transplant, and the transplant went well, but then he started coughing and then died a few weeks later. I think that somewhere down in my... I think my dad was concerned that he wasn't going to live long, and maybe that's what the focus was on, on training us so much. But do it. Train. Have some entertainment. I mean, you know, I'm not trying to get you to turn your homes into prison camps. You know, but equip. Equip. Find, get, get them placed. Now, now, gifting has nothing to do with whether or not they do chores. They, you know, it's kind of it's kind of like I used to tell our church staff. You know, uh, our church staff, we were training people, and we knew what their gifting was. But I would say this: if the ox is in the ditch, we don't care what your gifting is. Right. You know, I mean, if we're in a mess here, and we need to set up a hundred chairs, or or set something up, or something's messed up, and we, you know, it it doesn't matter to me if your gifting is not to set up chairs. You know, the ox is in the ditch. So, okay, well, that's the way it is at home. It, you know, it really doesn't matter if, if you, you know, you're, you might not be wired to wash dishes, but you're going to wash dishes. You, you, let, me, you let me tell you why. I got to hurry, and I, oh, boy, do I have to hurry. Listen, it's a crying shame that in the apostolic church, our homes can be summed up Largely by this, 
one worn out woman. That's sad. My, my dad told my mother, you're not ironing five shirts. She said, I'm not. No. We're going to train these boys to iron. My goodness, by the time I was 12 years old, I was ironing everything. I moved away at 18. There was no, I may have said this here before. I don't even remember what I've said. I hope this is not a repeat. Is this a repeat? Uh, go, okay, I'm going. There, when, hey, when, when it was time for me to move away and start working with that youth group and do my internship in that, in that Christian college and all that business, we didn't have any conversation like that. There was no conversation at the wash machine. Okay, now, Terry, don't wash your white underwear with your blue jeans. Don't, okay, here, this is a stove. This is how you turn it on. Make sure you, you don't, no, there was, what? There was no, there wasn't a conversation about nothing. How to maintain your car, my car, nothing, nothing. That had been handled so many years ago. I mean, I moved in my own apartment, and I took care of everything. I didn't have to have anybody coming in there. Now, then I was there three months, and then I didn't have to take care of it all because it burned down. And, I mean, everything that I had burned down. So then we were able to start all over. So it's like, you know, I mean, have you, has anybody here ever stood outside and watched everything that you own burn up? Has, has that happened? I mean, to walk in a store... And need it all. <laughs> what am I going to start with? I might as well start with shoes and work up because I need it all. You, you just, you must train. Train. You know, I mean, just train up. Don't entertain down. Let, let, me, let me say this quick, and then we'll, we'll hit this last one. Can you imagine what could happen in the church if we'd understand this equipping business? Can you, if God tarries, can you imagine what it would be like whenever our kids are the ones getting the leadership positions, and our kids are the ones that are getting management positions, and our kids are the ones starting companies, our kids are the ones running the, the upper level? You know, our kids are the ones that, why? Because they were trained. I'm just telling you it can happen. I mean, it can happen. Well, let's, let's, uh, let's land it. Number four. Resource responsibility. Resource responsibility. We must be responsible for our resources, uh, our time, our talent, and our money. Our time, talent, and treasure. And yes, I'm going to talk about money, so if you need to get the shakes, go ahead and get the shakes out. Just, just a minute. Our time. We have to learn to number our days. We just can't waste our days. I'm not, I'm not saying don't have a good time and all that business, but look, a, if, you're, if you're known in your family as a couch potato, you are probably not going to entertain, you're not going to train in a major way. Take a break when you need to take a break. But, if our, but if, if our children see us as lazy and, and no, no goals, no, then there's, it will be rare if they have any. Teach us to number our days. Talent is our personal ability. We, we just talked about that. Let's talk about money a second here. Um, I, have, I have at home... Um, a stewardship report. Now, if you don't know what a church stewardship report is, then you need to start giving. And then you'll find out what a stewardship report is. But there, I have Terry Shock 1962, uh, $2. It was a hand type job thing. It was before computers and all in 62. I was two years old. I didn't give $20. Somebody obviously gave me $20, and my parents paid tithes on it. Then I have my own tithing envelope that I filled out myself when I was five years old that had a nickel in it. 
It, it was a principle at our house. It, it was a principle. Um, I, asked, I asked Dad one time, I was a, a young teenager, and I said, you know, I was paying my tithes, you know, 50 cents or a dollar or what, whatever it was. I asked him, I said, what does Brother Lumpkin do with all this money? <laughs> that was our past. What does Brother Lumpkin do with all this money? And my, my dad said, it doesn't matter if he buys bathtubs full of bubble gum. He's getting on my level. He said, if we pay our tithes, God will bless us. If he's, if he's misusing it, God will handle him. Now, I know enough about this church because he's letting me in on everything that the systems and all on this church, your money is very safe. The, the, believe me, the finances of this church has run well. Now, where, where I pastored, where I was on the pastoral staff for 30 years, um, our senior pastor's family, they had been there since 1950, and it was a pretty large church for a, a small town of 42,000 people. Our, our church was a few thousand people. Well, they had torn their name up in the city. You know, the Mangans, they owned the church. Well, not true. You could just go down to the courthouse. We proved that wrong. It was not in their, it was not in their name. They, they do this. They do that. They're all, all they want is money. Money, money, money. And that kind of went through the city, so they were a little bit, you know, they didn't talk about giving hardly at all because they were a little gun shot. And one Sunday morning, uh, I was talking about giving or whatever, and, and, I just, and I finally just said, Look, look, church, my name is Shock. It's not Mangan. They have not trashed my name all over this city. I'm going to talk to you about your money. And then I said this, if you're not comfortable paying your tithes, you're not comfortable paying that level of tithing on what you owe, no problem. What we'll need to do is, is we'll need to pr pray that God will reduce your income down to what you are comfortable paying your tithes. Because we, because we want you to be saved. We, we want this thing to, to balance out. So if you, you know, if you can't pay, that's fine, no problem. You will just pray that we'll get this thing. Are you comfortable with, you know, paying, paying $5 a week? Cool. Lord, let them make 50. That's no, that's no problem. It's just, we can balance this whole thing out. You say, that is very ugly. No, it's not very ugly. It's the kingdom. I remember, uh, I remember I was, um, I was uh, 16, uh, 18, I was 18 years old, and I had, I had, I was called to preach when I was 16, and so Brother Lumpkin uh, was the pastor, he called me in. He said, uh, Terry, I noticed that you're behind on your tithes. Well, boy, that was not what I had on the list that day, was to hear that from him. I said, well, okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll get that caught up. And he looked at me, he said, you know what? He said, our church is not going to make it or not based on your tithes. I mean, you know, what, what could have I been making at, at that age? I wasn't making a whole lot. He said, but how do you think God is going to use you if he can't trust you with 10% of your money? Yes, sir, I'll fix that. Get, get, it, get it fixed. Resource responsibility. If we could put our lives and homes in position to be blessed, the whole spectrum, all in on God principles, I promise you, it would be amazing what God can do. And listen, let me, let me just say it where, where it really is. It is amazing what God wants to do. What he wants to do. As I close, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. 
and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thy eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. Then you look at Acts 2, 46 through 47. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God, and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily, which should be saved. So we see in Deuteronomy that it's talking about continually. In Acts, it's daily. And now in 2018, uh, many people think weekly, if I can just get to church on Sunday. Obviously, that's not you. You're Sunday and Wednesday people. But we do have an epidemic in the church world of the SMOs. SMO, Sunday morning only. So what's happened is, what's happened is, is there are people that think that they can just, you know, worship whatever, just on Sunday morning, and they wonder why that their life is just not clicking. Well then, in the New Testament, we, we see daily. Daily in the temple, all that kind of thing. But the foundation of all of it was in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy, continually. And so what, what must happen in the church world is we've got to move past this Sunday morning only thing, or Sunday and Wednesday. We, we've even got to go past the, the daily thing of, you know, in, in the temple or that, that kind of, a, which is great, which is fantastic. We've walked away from the continual thing. And this, this is where we've got to win it back in our homes. And that's the reason why it is me and my house. I thank God that I was raised by a man until I was 19 years old that, that was a Joshua-type man. He looked at us, boys, we're, we're going to love them, but we're not running our house like them. This is, this is our house. I can't, can't, you know, I can name names of some of my friends that, boy, when I was, whenever I was being raised, I thought, man, boy, you know what? I love my family, but it sure would be nice to be going by those, by those rules. Nope. It was me and my house. Me and my house. Um, I can tell you this. Me and, and my three brothers, we love God. My youngest brother's a pastor. My oldest brother was away from God from 18 years old until he was 54 and came back to God. And now he's, he's one of the strongest men in my youngest brother. My youngest brother is my oldest brother's pastor. Go figure that one out. And my oldest brother is the one that makes sure that the church is clean and drives a, a van loaded with people that he brings to church. And, and uh, he, he wins souls like my dad used to. I mean, it's, it's absolutely amazing. It's me and my house. My parents definitely took stands and they definitely had some very painful times. But the end in your situation is not yet. Where there's life, there's hope. Quit kicking yourself about, I wish out of this, I wish out of that. I, that you will not get anywhere with that. You start speaking faith. You, you start using knowledge aright. Let life come through. You have a spiritual house based on the decisions that you can make. And then let God do the rest. If you're the head of a household or you're the only one uh, here tonight maybe representing your home, would you just stand? I'm not, I'm not going to bring you down to the, to the front, but would you just stand? All, all heads of households.
all heads of households. Amen. Amen. We need to be the church on our street. Our homes need to be known as the place that if somebody needed help, we'd try to help them. There's, there's this many churches that need to get started in this area. Let's decide. You, you, cannot, you cannot change years of wrong overnight. But hear me. You can change directions in a minute. There's, there's things that, that if, if we had to do all over again, I promise you, if I had to do all over again and have my kids as babies, there are so many things that I would do different. So many things. But I can't do one thing about it now. I can just do what I can do now. Can we all just close our eyes? And if you're, if you're standing and you're comfortable with this, would you just lift your hands to heaven? And if you're seated, would you, would you uh, help us pray right now for the heads of households? Lord Jesus, we're coming to you. We're believing for the power of your Spirit. And we're believing that you're speaking. And God, I pray against how the enemy would come to complicate a very simple principle. But it takes you and your power to help us live out this principle. Every head of household right now, would you just tell God in your own way, Lord, I want to do it the way you want me to do it. And just help me. Help me. He, he will help. He will help. Just help me. I need you, God. Help me. If you have a family member, if you have a family member that's standing, would you just stand up by them now? Uh, as a matter of fact, can we all stand? Let's all stand. But if, if, if you had a, a family member standing, would you just put your hand over on them right now? Would you just put your hand over on them? Uh, if both of you were standing, just join together. Now, would you pray a prayer for the head? of the house would, would you would you pray and and would you decide in your in your heart and spirit right now that that you're going to get your home in, in divine order to where God can bless it can we just do that right now if you're if you're single pray pray for your home right now pray for your home Lord Jesus we're praying we're praying that we will embrace your law of divine order. And we're praying against the chaos and confusion that's in our homes. We're believing that your spirit is going to lead us and guide us to where our homes are going to be a place that you dwell and a place that people are built up and not torn down. We're believing that our homes are going to be equipping centers. We're believing that we are going to raise spiritual giants in our homes. We're believing that you're going to help us to correct what is wrong. And we know, God, that you will. We know, God, that you will. Let it be done in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And this altar area is open for anyone who wants to come forward and pray this message in. There's a lot here. There's growth opportunities for all of us. You're welcome to come forward and just pray this message in.